Good day everyone, welcome back to our channel Gurung Pinoy. Thank you so much for all your positive comments, positive feedbacks. Please keep them coming because you inspire me to do more videos that can help you pass the lead. So again, this is Gurung Pinoy. If you haven't done so yet, please do subscribe to our channel. You may also go to Facebook and like our Facebook page that's still Gurung Pinoy. Okay, so today's topic is teaching approaches, methods, strategies, and techniques. Now, in our previous topics, previous lessons, we'd always be giving free materials to all those people who are watching the video. I'm still gonna do that, but please be mindful and please be observant. I'm going to give you a hint on how to get our materials. Our materials today, the free materials, is going to be a 150 item test about teaching approaches, methods, strategies, and other stuff in the professional education for the lab. We'll only be giving those free materials to those people who are participating and to those people, of course, who are subscribed to our channel. Make sure that you like this video and that you subscribe to our channel, like our Facebook page, and we'll start with our discussion. So again, these four terms, teaching approaches, methods, teaching strategies, teaching techniques, are oftentimes confused with one another, okay? So this is the objective of our discussion today. Hopefully, after this lesson, you'd already know the difference between teaching approaches, teaching methods, strategies, and techniques. Okay, so the first term that we have here is teaching approach. Okay, so when you say teaching approach, this is a set of principles, beliefs, or ideas about the nature of learning, which is also, of course, translated into the classroom. It is also a teacher's personal philosophy of teaching, which means that these are your guiding principle. These are the tools to help you make decisions inside the classroom. What are your ideas about the nature of learning? Okay, so this is your teaching approach. Now let's go over the different teaching approaches in the K-12 curriculum. So we start with the first one. The first one is learner-centered, which means that teaching enables lifelong learning and independent problem solving. So of course, when you say learner-centered approach in teaching, the learner is in the center of your activities. Okay, It is the learner that you'd always give prime importance. Okay, so whatever decisions you make inside the classroom would depend on your learner. What your learner can achieve, what your learner is capable of doing, what your learner's experiences are inside and outside the classroom. Okay, so again, when you say learner-centered curriculum, you are trying to gauge the gap between the skills of your students so that they may be able to solve problems independently and that they'd realize that learning is a lifelong process and that they'd also learn to love learning. The second type of teaching approach in the K-12 curriculum is inclusive. So of course, when you say inclusive, this means it's EFA or education for all, which means that when you're teaching, you should include everyone, not just the rich kids, but also the poor kids, not only the kids in urban areas, but also those in rural areas, not only the kids from the modern countries or the well-to-do countries, but also those in third world countries. Okay, so that's the meaning of the term inclusive. Everyone is included, even those students with special needs. Okay, so no one is left behind. No one is left out. Everyone should be educated. That's inclusive approach to teaching. The third one is developmentally appropriate approach, which means that the tasks are within the developmental stage. So you only give tasks or homework or assignment to students that are within their grasp that are within their learning capacities. So you don't teach geometry, for example, to someone who's just in grade one or in the first grade. You don't teach division to someone who's just in kindergarten. Okay, so developmentally appropriate, that means the task should not be too easy nor be too hard for the child to learn. Now we go to the fourth one. The fourth teaching approach in the K-12 curriculum is responsive and relevant. This means Teaching is meaningful when related to students' lives. So when you say teaching approach is responsive and relevant, it is meaningful because the student can relate to it. Okay? It is something that he or she can relate with. And it is responsive because it answers the needs or the challenges that the student is facing currently in his life. Okay, So that means responsive and relevant to the student and even responsive to the needs of the society. 
That's number four. We go to number five. It should be culture sensitive. This means that teaching should respect cultures. Okay, so when you are teaching, you should be aware that some of the cultures are different, especially if you are teaching in an international school. I had experienced teaching in Saudi Arabia for two years, and when I was there, and when I would be teaching students there, I should be very mindful that I don't hurt their feelings, I don't hurt their beliefs, especially their religion. So I can't say words like pork or pig, ham, okay? So those stuff, or even most especially Jesus Christ, I can't mention those because of course they're Muslims. So when you're teaching and you're using the culture sensitive approach, that means you should be respectful of other people's cultures. The sixth teaching approach is contextualized and global. This means you should be exerting effort beyond the classroom. We all know that the world has become very small right now because of all the advances, the technology that we have. Okay, So before, it would take weeks to communicate with someone from the other side of the world. Okay, This usually would be done through mails, through the snail mail. But nowadays, it's actually real-time communication that's happening because we have Messenger, we have WhatsApp, we have Skype. We have all these things. We have Zoom. Okay, so when you say contextualized and global, teaching right now should not just be within the four corners of our classroom. It should be global. It should be making the students become globally competitive. That means if you are teaching something or some facts to a student who's in fourth grade, that should be the same things that someone who's also in fourth grade in another side of the world is also learning. Okay, so when you're teaching, whatever concepts you're teaching should also be competent with those that are being taught in other countries. Okay, so that's contextualized and global approach to teaching. Next one, the next approach that we have here is research-based. This means that teaching and learning are anchored on researches. Now, we all know that this is very true, it's especially in the Philippines, since many of our new curriculum are actually anchored on the different researches, the different findings, the different advancements that we have on education. Okay, But the only downside to this is sometimes the curriculum is not fully implemented yet when something that's new comes out, the government embarks on that. Okay, So sometimes we're not done implementing a certain curriculum yet, then we have to start with another new curriculum. You don't really see the fruits of a certain curriculum since we need to jump to another bandwagon. Number eight is constructivist approach. This means students build upon their prior knowledge. So when you say constructivist, your basis is always the experience of the students. You always start with what your students already know and you build upon that knowledge. Because of course, learning there becomes more meaningful, learning there becomes more relevant, Hence, learning becomes easier, learning becomes more enjoyable, and learning becomes more permanent to your students. Okay, so constructivist approach. Another thing that you need to remember about this is that students make their own meaning. They construct their own meaning. You're not just giving them the definitions of words, but you give them activities so that they can come up with their own definition of the word. The ninth approach to teaching that we have in the K-12 is inquiry-based. Okay, this means learning through student-generated questions. So gone are the days when we just give facts, figures, all those details to our students. Nowadays, we'd always encourage the students to ask questions, okay? Because if they're asking questions, then that means they are engaged in active learning, okay? So when you say inquiry-based, the learning is through the questions that are coming from the students. What do they really know? What do they understand? And so in this manner, or in this process, we as the teachers learn from the students, the students learn from us, and the students would also be learning from one another. Now, the 10th teaching approach in the K-12 curriculum is reflective teaching. This means the teacher thinks over his or her teaching. So when you are saying reflective teaching, this means as a teacher, when you go back home, when you are already lying on your bed, for example, you think about what happened or what transpired during the day. Okay, so what were some of the things that became effective? What were some of the things that didn't really work? What are some of the things that I need to improve upon? Okay, so that's reflective teaching 
thinking about what happened in your teaching the entire day or teaching about your teaching. That's reflective teaching, which is very important for you to improve as a teacher. Now, the 11th approach in the K-12 curriculum is the collaborative approach, which means the use of teamwork, group work, and partnerships. Now, this can happen in several ways. You can have collaborative approach or you can have collaborative work between students so the students can go on teamwork, they can work in a group, they can work as partners. It can also be a collaboration between the student and the teacher. For example, in researches, okay, so usually a student would have a research advisor and the student would just go to the research advisor to ask for advice. The advisor would give some important guide to the student and then the student can go back to just doing things on her own. Or it can also be between teachers or what we call our PLCs, professional learning communities, which are also very important. Okay, so teachers who are working in the same subject or teachers who are teaching the same subject can work together and can come up with a common lesson plan, common activities, common assessment. In that way, when we're working together, as we know, two heads are better than one. And of course, assessment becomes valid across the different sections that you have in a grade level. Number 12 teaching approach is integrative. And this means it's interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary. When you say interdisciplinary, this means you are only concerned with one subject. Now, when you say interdisciplinary, you are concerned with the relationship between different subjects or different subjects are molded together blended together that's interdisciplinary and of course when you say transdisciplinary learning can also be transmitted or learning can also be translated in real life now we go to the 13th teaching approach in the k-12 curriculum and this is mother tongue based multilingual education now this means that teaching uses more than one language and it starts with the mother tongue so as we all know before, our curriculum was only taught using English and Filipino. Well, actually, the curriculum has been taught in different languages all throughout the history of Philippine education. There was a time when they used English during the American occupation. They also used Nihongo during the Japanese occupation. They also used Spanish or Tagalog mixed together. But now we're using mother tongue based multilingual education. So not just bilingual, not just Filipino and English, but also the use of mother tongue. So we all know that the students nowadays are also using the mother tongue language, which is actually very difficult for them, okay? So I'd always joke about this. I'd always say the mother tongue nowadays is not called mother tongue, but it's actually grandmother tongue because it's not the usual words that we use when we're speaking, when we're talking to each other in vernacular. But those are words that are really deep in meaning. Now to complete our teaching approaches in the K-12 curriculum, we have the last one, which is spiral progression. This means the same concept is taught from one level to another in increasing complexity. Now, this is very common in the use of our K-12 program, which means that a student from the first grade until the last grade of basic education is being taught the same concept, but the concept just becomes harder as a student progresses from lower grades until the higher grades. Okay, so the same concept taught from one level to another and then the complexity, the difficulty of the concept just increases. Now we go to the next term that we have, which is teaching method. What is a teaching method? Now, when you say teaching method, this is a set of orderly, logically arranged steps in teaching. Okay, so these are steps in teaching that are orderly. That means they are arranged properly and they are arranged based on logic. So when you're talking about teaching method, this means it is more procedural. Okay, what's your procedure? What do you do first? What comes next? Are you always starting with motivation? After that, would you have activity proper, evaluation, assessment, do you give homework, do you start with a review instead of motivation, things like this, okay? So set of orderly, logically arranged steps in teaching and it is more procedural. Now we'll start with the comparison of those teaching methods that are very commonly used inside the classroom. The first two that we have here are inductive versus deductive methods of teaching. Now you see the words here, general and specific. 
Now, when you say inductive method in teaching, you start from the specific and you guide the students towards making generalizations. Say you're talking about the different Asian countries. Okay, so when you say inductive, you start from the specific, then you go to general. So you can say uh, Japan, Philippines, Korea, uh, India, Thailand, Pakistan, and then you generalize. They are countries that are found in Asia. But when you say deductive method, it's the opposite. So you start with the general and you go back to the specific. So you say, you can tell the students, now, today we are going to be studying or we are going to be talking about the different Asian countries. So you can write the terms Asian countries on the board and the students can give you the specific types of or the specific countries that we have in Asia. So again, inductive is from specific, the examples, to general. Well, deductive is from general to the specific or to the examples. Now, the second thing, so we are going to be comparing are the direct method of teaching and the indirect method of teaching. When you say direct method, this is actually teacher-centered. Okay, so you think of the teacher as the sage on stage. Sage here means expert. Okay, so the teacher is the one that drives the learning. The teacher is the one who talks too much, who talks a lot inside the classroom. The students would just be learning from the teacher. Okay, so that's the direct teaching method. It's teacher-centered. The teacher is a sage on stage. But when you say indirect teaching method, it is student-centered. The teacher becomes just the guide on the side. So the teacher becomes just a facilitator of learning. So when you say indirect teaching method, the student discovers things, discover concepts on his own or on her own. The teacher is just there to facilitate. The teacher is just there as a guide. So these are the differences between your direct teaching method, which is teacher-based or teacher-centered, and indirect teaching method, which is student-centered. The next teaching method that we have is lecture. We're all very familiar with all this since this is a very traditional method of teaching. So when you say lecture, the teacher talks a lot. The lecture method is used when the teacher does not have enough time. So this is the method that we use in review centers. Okay, So the teachers would just be giving lectures, would just be talking nonstop. The next thing that we have, the next teaching method is discussion. Now, we know the meaning of what discussion is. We share ideas with one another. We discuss things. We talk about certain things. We talk about theories. We talk about concepts. We talk about topics. Okay, so that's a discussion teaching method. Next one is reporting. So usually when you say reporting, this is a type of lecture. But in this case, the students are the one who are giving lectures. So that's reporting method. And we are also very familiar with this. We have done reporting at least once in our lives as students. The next teaching method that we have is demonstration. This is a teacher-led type of teaching method. So the teacher would usually show the students how to do things, how things are done. That's the demonstration. And the students are just made to observe. But sometimes the, the students are also given a chance to do things on their own. Okay, So after the teacher demonstrated it, the students can also be given a chance to try doing things on their own. The next teaching method that we have is self-pacing. As what the word suggests, self-pacing, this means the student is learning on her own or on his own at his own pace. Okay, so that means kanya-kanyang oras, the students can use their own schedule. We call this modular learning method. Okay, so modular, may modules lamang. There are modules that are given and then the student would try to finish one module before he or she can go to the next steps, okay? can go to the next modules. Now, the next type of teaching method that we have is investigatory. As the name suggests, of course, the students here would be performing investigations. It can be simple lab work, for example. It can be case studies. But the students would be coming up with researches, with questions. They'd be dealing with trying to answer these questions in their investigations. Next one, the last one that we have for teaching method here would be integrated, which is also called blended teaching. So teaching of one subject is related to teaching of another subject. Okay, so that's integrated approach. Okay, so we're already halfway in our discussion. And the next topic that we have is teaching strategy. Now, what are some teaching strategies? 
Now, again, we're done with teaching approaches. So when you say teaching approaches, this is your teaching principle. This is your drive in teaching. These are some of your beliefs in teaching. We're also done with the teaching method. So when you say teaching method is set of orderly arranged steps, okay, that you use in teaching. Now, for teaching strategy, this means a method of approaching the task of teaching, mode of operation to achieve a goal, okay? And this requires some sort of planning. So when you say teaching strategy, these are the things that you are writing when you make your lesson plan, okay? So for example, you already have your set of objectives and you think of ways so that your students would learn these objectives or would would reach those objectives. So when you're thinking of the activities that you'd like to make your students work on or the activities that your students are going to be doing for them to reach those objectives, you're actually thinking about your strategy. Okay, so we started the first type. Uh, the first one, you can have reciprocal learning. So when you say reciprocal learning, two students would be working with each other and they learn from each other. So that's reciprocal learning. The next one that we have here is jigsaw. Uh, just like your jigsaw puzzle here, the concepts are divided by the number of students that you have and they try to put the pieces together by learning from each other. So say one person would take this topic, another person would take this topic, and another one would take this topic, and they are going to make a whole concept from each other's topic. So that's the jigsaw strategy. The next strategy that we have here is Philip 666. You might not be familiar with this, but Philip 666 is just using the number six. So for example, you have your students, you divide them into six groups. Each group would have six students or less in a group. And then they'd be given, they'd be dividing six topics. Each one of them would be talking in six minutes. Okay, so all the things that they're doing is based on the number six. Okay, so that's Philip 666. This would usually come out to the left. So make sure that you know how this happens. Okay, so the next strategy that we have is think, pair, share. This usually happens by making your students think first on their own, and then you pair them up, and then the members of the pair would share their ideas. Okay, so they start thinking alone, you pair them up, and then they share their topics or they share the, their ideas about a certain topic. The next thing that we have here is fishbowl, the fishbowl teaching strategy. So in your fishbowl teaching strategy, you usually would draw lots from a fishbowl, okay? So you'll have a bowl, for example, or you have a box and you draw out names from those box and you make that person answer a certain question. Or it can also be the other, the other way around. You can also put the questions in your fishbowl and you assign a question to one student. Now, the next teaching strategy that we have here, also very commonly used inside the classroom, is role play. We all like having this in the classroom as a student or as a teacher. It's also a very enjoyable teaching strategy. So the students are made to play roles and they act in a skit or they act as a group. Okay, so that's role play. The last one that will complete our teaching strategy is debate. All right, so again, debate is also used inside the classroom. You have two sides, the pros and the cons, the affirmative side and the negative side, and they are made to speak their minds out about a certain topic. They'd be giving their sides and they'd be defending it. They'd be challenging the ideas of the other side. Okay, so that's debate. And usually the teacher would be the moderator in a debate. Okay, so that ends our teaching strategy. So again, we're done with teaching approaches. These are your principles, your uh, ideas of teaching. Your We're also done with teaching methods, the steps that you use or the steps that you follow in teaching. We're also done with teaching strategy. So what are some things that you plan for or the activities that you'd want your students to do so that they'd reach their goal? Okay, so that's your teaching strategy. Now, before we go to the last part, which is the teaching techniques, I'm going to give you a hint on how to get our freebie. Now, for you to get the freebie, I'd like you to first like this video, hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so yet, then write your email address in the comment box below, plus any topic that you'd want me to cover. So again, like this video, subscribe, and comment your email address and any topic that you'd want me to discuss. And then I'm going to send you 
the free material, which is 150 items, which already has an answer key. Okay, so to complete our discussion today, we go to the last slide. This is the teaching technique. Now, when you say teaching technique, this is a teacher's personal style or trick to accomplish the task of teaching. Another thing that you need to remember about the teaching technique is that these are tricks that can be taught to another teacher. A lot of the in-services and workshops all teachers attend offer little tidbits of games, activities, and actions that teachers can use to achieve certain goals in the classroom. So when you say teaching technique, these are tricks that work in your classroom, like how do you check the attendance? Do you do the roll call? Do you just use the seat plan? How do you control the number of students that would go to the restroom? How do you check their assignment? For example, do you ask them to swap work and check them? How do you make sure that students do their work? So these are the tricks. These are the teaching technique that you may have. So when you say teaching technique, these are the tricks that you think are working in your room. And these are tricks that you can teach another teacher. So again, that is what you call a teaching technique. All right, so that ends our discussion today. So again, make sure that you follow the steps that we have there, the steps that I have given you so that you'll receive the freebie that we have for this video. Sa muli, ito po ang inyong gurong Pinoy na nagsasabing maliit man na butil ng mga kaalaman. Ang dulo nito ay malaking kaginawaan. Maraming salamat sa inyong pakikinig. Mabuhay kayo and stay safe mga kaguro.